nicotine had it traditionally been delivered in a nice mug with a frothy top and cinnamon sprinkles would not have had its current association with COPD, lung cancer, heart disease and so on because it just wouldn't have caused them. Indeed, in such a form, it would not be associated with significant health hazards or any incapacitations and its potential to induce dependence would not pose a serious problem, either for the individual or society. In that respect, it would be almost exactly like caffeine. That therefore suggests that there is no real need to quit using nicotine and that would be true were it not for one thing and that one thing is burning tobacco. Now, numerous studies have shown that smokers smoke for nicotine. Look at John Britton, look at all of the people that know about this. They smoke for nicotine but they're damaged by the smoke. Mark Pawsey said that in his delivery. The nicotine they want does them very little harm. It's the method of delivery that causes the problems. So what happens if you change the delivery method? What would happen if we could remove the death from a cigarette but leave all the pleasure? And the answer must surely be that we'd all but eradicate the almost 700,000 premature deaths caused reportedly by the use of lit tobacco in Europe every year. If we believe the rhetoric from the anti-smoking industry and confine ourselves only to the UK, somewhere in the region of 10 million lives would be transformed. They would be given another 10 to 15 years longer to live. The Department of Health tells us that every 15 cigarettes you smoke creates one mutation. It causes one mutation in your body. The dual fueler, by definition, reduces their intake of smoked cigarettes every time they use an e-cig. Because if they were going to have a fag and they use an e-cig, they're not having a fag. So if a 20 a day smoker replaces just 15 cigarettes a day with e-cig usage, then their exposure to mutation reduces to 25% of what it once was. And if you go down to one a day, it goes down to 5% of what it, what, of what it once was. The maths is obvious and it's incontrovertible. And finally, let's look at this, this risk of somebody moving up, uh, moving on from e-cigs to, to uh, tobacco. It's a risk versus benefit scenario, which the EU has to take into account. Now, there is a risk, but it's very, very low, that someone who took up nicotine usage via an e-cig might move to smoke combustible cigarettes. But if anybody, anybody out there was to compare a flavoured e-cig, whatever it happens to be, uh, whether it's DY4, whether it's custard, whether it's vanilla, whether it's strawberry, whether it's chocolate, it doesn't make any difference. If you compare the flavour of that with the flavour of a combustible cigarette, especially if you were a new starter to them, you'd take one drag off a fag and you'd throw up. It's not going to happen. And that's just one of the reasons why the flavours that are available are as important as they are. They represent a barrier to entry for tobacco cigarettes and a major barrier to relapse in people that have already made the switch to e-cigs. So summing it all up, an e-cig represents the cleanest form of delivery that's acceptable to smokers and it has to be acceptable to smokers in order to work. In terms of nicotine use initiation, an e-cig is no worse than coffee, either for the individual or for the general public. We know that to be true, it's been stated many times. Because of the cleanliness of its delivery of nicotine, the e-cig has potential to completely eradicate tobacco-related diseases, or actually more, more appropriately, smoking-related diseases, such as lung cancer, COPD, and so on, by effectively obsoleting smoked tobacco. And given the nature of the benefits, the risk of somebody initiating nicotine use with an e-cig and moving to lit tobacco is far outweighed by the benefits to the generality of the public because the numbers are likely to be so small. And finally, if you look at the long term, if 90% of the nicotine using public are using e-cigs and that is seen as the norm, 
much as no one considers a coffee or tea drinker to be a deviant, how the hell is that a problem given what we've said above? Thank you.